Atom Drive by Charles Fontenay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Atom Drive the two spaceship crews were friendly enemies sitting across the table from each other for their last meal before blast-off. Outside the ports, the sky was nothing but light-streaked blackness, punctured periodically by Earth glare, for Space Station Two whirled swiftly on its axis, creating an artificial gravity. John or I figured you the last man ever to desert the rockets for a hot rod tow job chided Russo Bayat, captain of the Mars Corporation's gleaming new freighter Marsward 18. Bayat was fat and red-faced, and one of the shrewdest space captains in the business. Johnner Johns, at the other end of the table, inclined his grizzled head and smiled. "'Times change, Russo,' he answered quietly. "'Even the Mars Corporation can't stop that.' "'Is it true that you're pulling five thousand tons of cargo, Captain?' asked one of the crewmen of the Marsward 18. "'Something like that,' agreed Johnner, and his smile broadened. "'And I have only about twice the fuel supply you carry for a one hundred-ton payload.' The communicator above them squawked and blared. "'Captain Johns and Captain Beat of Martian Competition Run, please report to Control for final briefing.' "'I knew it.' grumbled Bayat, getting heavily and reluctantly to his feet. I haven't gotten to finish a meal on this blasted merry-go-round yet. In the space station's control section, Commander Ortega of the Space Control Commission, an ascetic officer in plain blues, looked them up and down severely. As you know, gentlemen, he said, blast-off time is O six hundred. Tonnage of cargo, fuel, and empty vessels cannot be a factor under the law. The Mars Corporation will retain its exclusive franchise to the Earth-Mars run unless the ship sponsored by Atom Star Company returns to Earth with a full cargo at least twenty hours ahead of the ship sponsored by the Mars Corporation. Cargo must be unloaded at Mars and new cargo taken on. I do not consider the twenty-hour bias in favor of the Mars Corporation a fair one, said Ortega severely, turning his gaze to Bayat. But the Space Control Commission does not make the laws. It enforces them. Docking and loading facilities will be available to both of you on an equal basis at Phobos and Marsport. Good luck. He shook hands with both of them. Saturn, I'm glad to get out of there, exclaimed Bayat, mopping his brow as they left the control section. Every time I take a step, I feel like I'm falling on my face. It's because the control section's so close to the center, replied Johnner. The station's spinning to maintain artificial gravity, and your feet are away from the center. As long as you're standing upright, the pull is straight up and down to you, but actually your feet are moving faster than your head in a larger orbit. When you try to move as in normal gravity, your body swings out of that line of pull and you nearly fall. The best corrective I've found is to lean backward slightly when you start to walk. As the two space captains walked back toward the wardroom together, Bayat said, Johnner, I hear the Mars Corporation offered you the Marsward 18 for this run first, and you turned them down. Why? You piloted the Marsward 5 and the Wayward Lady for Mars Corp when those upstarts in the Argentine were trying to crack the Earth-Mars run. This Atom Star couldn't have enough money to buy you away from Mars Corp. No, Mars Corp offered me more, said Johnner soberly now. But this atomic drive is the future of space travel, Rousseau. Mars Corp has it, but they're sitting on it, because they've got their fingers in hydrazine interests here, and the atom drive will make hydrazine useless for space fuel. Unless I can break the franchise for Atom Star, it may be a hundred years before we switch to the atom drive in space. What the hell difference does that make to you? asked Bayat bluntly. Hydrazine's expensive replied Johnner. Reaction mass isn't, and you use less of it. I was born on Mars, Russo. 
Mars is my home, and I want to see my people get the supplies they need from Earth at a reasonable transport cost, not pay through the nose for every packet of vegetable seed. They reached the wardroom door. Too bad I have to degrav my old chief, said Beat, chuckling. But I'm a rocket man myself, and I say to hell with your hot rod atom drive. I'm sorry you got deflected into this run, Johnner. You'll never break Mars Corp's orbit. The Marsward 18 was a huge vessel, the biggest the Mars Corporation ever had put into space. It was a collection of spheres and cylinders joined together by a network of steel ties. Nearly ninety percent of its weight was fuel for the one-way trip to Mars. Its competitor, the Radiant Hope, riding ten miles away in orbit around the Earth, was the strangest-looking vessel ever to get clearance from a space station. It looked like a tug towing a barge. The tug was the atomic power plant. Two miles behind, attached by a thin cable, was the passenger compartment and cargo. On the control deck of the Radiant Hope, Johnner gripped a microphone and shouted profane instructions at the pilot of a squat ground-to-space rocket twenty miles away. Tan Li Cho, the ship's engineer, was peering out the port at the speck of light toward which Johnner was directing his wrath, while Kokal, the Martian astrogator, worked at his charts on the other side of the deck. "'I thought all cargo was aboard, Johnner,' said Tan. "'It is.' said Johnner, laying the mic aside. That G-boat isn't hauling cargo. It's going with us. I'm not taking any chances on Mars Corp refusing to ferry our cargo back and forth at Mars. Is plotted, Johnner, boomed Kokol, turning his head to peer at them with huge eyes through the spidery tangle of his thin, double-jointed arms and legs. He reached an eight-foot arm across the deck and handed Johnner his figures. Johnner gave them to Tan. "'Figure out power for that one, Tan,' ordered Johnner, and took his seat in the cushioned control chair. Tan pulled a slide rule from his tunic pocket, but his black almond eyes rested quizzically on Johnner. "'It's four hours before blast-off,' he reminded. "'I've cleared power for this with space control,' replied Johnner. "'That planet-loving G-boat jockey missed orbit. We'll have to swing out a little and go to him.' On a conventional spacecraft, the order for acceleration would have sent the engineer to the engine deck to watch his gauges and report by intercom. But the Radiant Hope's engine deck was the atomic tug two miles ahead, which Tan, in heavy armor, would enter only in emergencies. He calculated for a moment, then called softly to Johnner. Pile one in ten. In ten, confirmed Johnner pulling a lever on the calibrated gauge of the radio control. Pile two in fifteen. In fifteen. Check. I'll have the length of burst figured for you in a jiffy. A faint glow appeared around the atomic tug far ahead, and there was the faintest shiver in the ship. But after a moment, Kukol said in a puzzled tone, No geez, Johnner. Engine not work? Sure she's working, said Johnner with a grin. You'll never get any more G than we've got now, Kokol, all the way to Mars. Our maximum acceleration will be one three-thousandth G. One three-thousandth, exclaimed Tan, shaken out of his oriental calm. Johnner, the Mars word will blast away at one or two Gs. How do you expect to beat that at one three-thousandth? Because they have to cut off and coast most of the way in an elliptical orbit like any other rocket, answered Johnner calmly. We drive straight across the system under power all the time. We accelerate halfway, decelerate the other half. But one three thousandth? You'll be surprised at what constant power can do. I know Beat, and I know the trick he's going to use. It's obvious from the blast-off time they arranged. He's going to tack off the moon and use his power right to cut twenty days off that regular 237-day schedule. But this tugboat will make it in 154 days. They took aboard the 200-ton landing boat. By the time they got it secured, the radio already was sounding warnings for blast-off. Zero hour arrived. Again, Johnner pulled levers. 
and again the faint glow appeared around the tail of their distant tug. Across space the exhaust of the Marsward 18 flared into blinding flame. In a moment it began to pull ahead visibly, and soon was receding like a meteor. Near the Radiant Hope, the space station seemed not to have changed position at all. "'The race is not always to the swift,' remarked Jonner philosophically. "'And we're the tortoise,' said Tan. "'How about filling us in on this jaunt, Jonner?' "'Is should, Jonner,' agreed Koko. "'Tan know all about crazy new engine. I know all about crazy new orbit. Both not know all. You tell.' "'I'd plan to anyway,' said Jonner. "'I had figured on having Serge in on it, but he wouldn't understand much of it anyhow. There's no use waking him up.' Serge was the ship's doctor psychologist and fourth member of the crew. He was asleep below on the center deck. "'For your information, Kokal said Jonner, "'the atomic engine produces electrical energy which accelerates reaction mass. Actually, it's a crude ion engine.' Tan can explain the details to you later, but the important thing is that the fuel is cheap, the fuel-to-cargo ratio is low, and constant acceleration is practical. As for you, Tan, I was surprised at your not understanding why we'll use low acceleration. To boost the engine power and give us more G's, we'd either have to carry more fuel or coast part of the way on momentum like an ordinary rocket. This way's more efficient, and our sixty-three day margin over the Marsward each way is more than enough for unloading and loading more cargo and fuel. With those figures, I can't see how Marscorp expects to win this competition, said Tan. We've got them flat on the basis of performance, agreed Jonner, so we'll have to watch for tricks. I know Marscorp. That's why I arranged to take aboard that G boat at the last minute. Mars Corp controls all the G-boats at Mars Port, and they're smart enough to keep us from using them in spite of the Space Control Commission. As for refueling for the return trip, we can knock a chunk off of Phobos for reaction mass. The meteor alarm bells clanged suddenly, and the screen lit up once with a fast-moving red line that traced the path of the approaching object. "'Miss us about half a mile,' said Jonner, after a glance at the screen must be pretty big, and it's coming up. He and Tan floated to one of the ports, and in a few moments saw the object speed by. That's no meteor, exclaimed Jonner with a puzzled frown. That's man-made, but it's too small for a G-boat. The radio blared. All craft in orbit near Space Station 2, warning. All craft near Space Station 2, experimental missile misfired from White Sands, repeat. "'Experimental missile misfired from White Sands. Coordinates?' "'Fine time to tell us,' remarked Tan dryly. "'Experimental missile, hell,' snorted John, her comprehension dawning. "'Cocal, what would have happened if we hadn't shifted orbit to take aboard that G-boat?' "'Cocal calculated a moment. "'Hit our engines,' he announced. "'Dead center.' "'Johnner's blue eyes clouded ominously. Looks like they're playing for keeps this time, boys. The Brotherhood of Spacemen is an exclusive club. Any captain, astrogator, or engineer is likely to be well known to his colleagues, either personally or by reputation. The ship's doctor psychologist is in a different category. Most of them sign on for a few runs for the adventure of it, as a means of getting back and forth between planets without paying the high cost of passage, or to pick up even more money than they can get from lucrative planet-bound practice. Jonner did not know Serge, the Radiant Hope's doctor. Neither Tan nor Kokol had ever heard of him. But Serge appeared to know his business well enough and was friendly enough. It was Serge's first trip, and he was very interested in the way the ship operated. He nosed into every corner of it and asked a hundred questions a day. "'You're as inquisitive as a cadet spaceman, Serge,' Donner told him on the twenty-fifth day out. Everybody knew everyone else well by then, which meant that Jonner and Kokol, who had served together before, had become acquainted with Tan and Serge. "'There's a lot to see and learn about space, Captain,' said Serge. He was a young fellow with fair hair and an easy grin. "'Think I could go outside?' "'If you keep a lifeline hooked on.' 
The suits have magnetic shoes to hold you to the hull of the ship, but you can lose your footing. Thanks, said Serge. He touched his hand to his forehead and left the control deck. Jonner, near the end of his eight-hour duty shift, watched the dials. The red light showing the inner airlock door was open blinked on. It blinked off. Then the outer airlock indicator went on and off. A shadow fell across Jonner briefly. He glanced at the port and reached for the microphone. "'Careful, and don't step on any of the ports,' he warned Serge. "'The magnetic soles won't hold on them.' "'I'll be careful, sir,' answered Serge. No one but a veteran spaceman would have noticed the faint quiver that ran through the ship, but Jonner felt it. Automatically he swung his control chair, and his eyes swept the bank of dials. At first he saw nothing. The outer lock light blinked on and off, and then the inner lock indicator. That was Serge coming back inside. Then Jonner noted that the hand on one dial rested on zero. Above the dial was the word acceleration. His eyes snapped to the radio controls. The atomic pile levers were still at their proper calibration. The dials above them said the engines were working properly. The atomic tug was still accelerating. But the passengers and cargo were in freefall. Swearing, Jonner jerked at the levers to pull out the piles aboard the tug. A blue flash flared across the control board, momentarily blinding him. Jonner recoiled, only his webbed safety belt preventing him from plummeting from the control chair. He swung back anxiously to the dials, brushing futilely at the spots that swam before his eyes. He breathed a sigh of relief. The radio controls had operated. The atomic engines had ceased firing. Tentatively, cautiously, he reversed the lever. There was no blue flash this time, but neither did the dials quiver. He swore. Something had burned out in the radio controls. He couldn't reverse the tug. He punched the general alarm button viciously, and the raucous clangor of the bell sounded through the confines of the ship. One by one, the other crew members popped up to the control deck from below. He turned the controls over to Kokol. "'Take readings on that damn tug,' Jonner ordered. "'I think our cable broke. Tan, let's go take a look.' When they got outside, they found about a foot of the one-inch cable still attached to the ship. The rest of it, drawn away by the tug before Jonner could cut acceleration, was out of sight. "'Can it be welded, Tan?' "'It can, but it'll take a while,' replied the engineer slowly. First, we'll have to reverse that tug and get the other end of that brake." "'Damn! And the radio controls burned out. I tried to reverse it before I sounded the alarm. Tan, how fast can you get those controls repaired?' "'Great space!' exclaimed Tan softly. "'Without seeing it, I'd say at least two days, Jonner. Those controls are complicated as hell.' They re-entered the ship. Kokol was working at his diagrams, and Serge was looking over his shoulder. Jonner took a heat gun quietly from the rack and pointed it at Serge. "'You'll get below, mister,' he commanded grimly. "'You'll be handcuffed to your bunk from here on out.' "'Sir, I don't understand,' stammered Serge. "'Like hell you don't. You cut that cable,' Jonner accused. Serge started to shrug, but he dropped his eyes. They paid me, he said in a low tone. They paid me a thousand solars. What good would a thousand solars do you when you're dead, Serge? Dead of suffocation and drifting forever in space. Serge looked up in astonishment. Why, you can still reach Earth by radio easy, he said. It wouldn't take long for a rescue ship to reach us. Chemical rockets have their limitations, said Jonner coldly. And you don't realize what speed we've built up with steady acceleration. We'd head straight out of the system, and nothing could intercept us if that tug had gotten too far before we noticed it was gone. He jabbed the white-faced doctor with the muzzle of the heat gun. Get below, he ordered. I'll turn you over to space control at Mars. When Serge had left the control deck, Jonner turned to the others. His face was grave. That tug picked up speed before I could shut off the engines after the cable was cut, he said. It's moving away from us slowly and at a tangent. 
and solar gravity's acting on both bodies now. By the time we get those controls repaired, the drift may be such that we'll waste weeks maneuvering the tug back. I could get out to the tug in a spacesuit before it gets too far away, said Tan thoughtfully. But that wouldn't do any good. There's no way of controlling the engines at the tug. It has to be done by radio. If we get out of this, remind me to recommend that atomic ships always carry a spare cable, said Jonner gloomily. If we had one, we could splice them and hold the ship to the tug until the controls are repaired. "'Is cable in cargo strong enough, Jonner?' asked Kokol. "'That's right!' exclaimed Jonner, brightening. "'Most of our cargo is cable. That four-thousand-ton spool we're hauling back there is six thousand miles of cable to lay a television network between the Martian cities.' "'Television cable?' repeated Tan doubtfully. "'Will that be strong enough?' It's bound in Flonite, that new fluorine compound. It's strong enough to tow this whole cargo at a couple of G's. There's nothing aboard this ship that would cut off a length of it. A heat gun at full power wouldn't even scorch it. But we can unwind enough of it and block the spool. It'll hold the ship to the tug until the controls can be repaired. Then we can reverse the tug and weld the cable. You mean the whole six thousand miles of it is in one piece? demanded Tan in astonishment. Well, that's not so much. The cable-laying steamer Dominia carried three thousand miles in one piece to lay Atlantic cables in the early twentieth century. But how will we ever get four thousand tons in one piece down to Mars? asked Tan. No G-boat can carry that load. Jonner chuckled. The same way they got it up from Earth to the ship, he answered. They attached one end of it to a G-boat and sent it up to orbit then wound it up on a fast winch. Since the G-boat will be decelerating to Mars, the unwinding will have to be slowed or the cable would tangle itself all over Sirtis. Sounds like it's made to order, said Tan, grinning. I'll get into my spacesuit. You'll get to work on the radio controls, contradicted Jonner, getting up. That's something I can't do. And I can get into a spacesuit and haul a length of cable out to the tug. Coco can handle the winch. De Viet, the Atom Star Company's representative at Mars City, and Kruger of the Space Control Commission were waiting when the Radiant Hope's G-boat dropped down from the Phobos station and came to rest in a wash of jets. They rode out to the G-boat together in a commission ground car. Jonner emerged from the G-boat, following the handcuffed Surge. "'He's all yours,' Jonner told Kruger, gesturing at Surge. You have my radio reports on the cable cutting, and I'll make my log available to you. Kruger put his prisoner in the front seat of the ground car beside him, and Jonner climbed in the back seat with Devit. I brought the crates of dyes for the ground car factory down this time, Jonner told Devit. We'll bring down all the loose cargo before shooting the television cable down. While they're unloading the G-boat, I wish you'd get the tanks refilled with hydrazine and nitric acid. I've got enough to get back up, but not enough for a round trip. What do you plan to do? asked Devit. He was a dark-skinned, long-faced man with a sardonic twist to his mouth. I've got to sign on a new ship's doctor to replace Surge. When the Marsward comes in, Mars Corp will have a dozen G-boats working round the clock to unload and reload her. With only one G-boat, we've got to make every hour count. We still have reaction mass to pick up on Phobos. Right agreed Devit. You can take the return cargo up in one load, though. It's just twenty tons of Martian relics for the Solar Museum. Mars to Earth cargoes run light. At the administration building, Jonner took his leave of Devit and went up to the Space Control Commission's personnel office on the second floor. He was in luck. On the board as applying for a Mars Earth run as a ship's doctor psychologist was one name. Lana Eldon. He looked up the name in the Mars City directory and dialed into the city from a nearby telephone booth. A woman's voice answered. "'Is Lana Eldon there?' asked Jonner. "'I'm Lana Eldon,' she said. Jonner swore under his breath, a woman, but if she weren't qualified, her name would not have been on the commission board. The verbal contract was made quickly, and Jonner cut the commission monitor into the line to make it binding. 
That was done often when rival ships, even of the same line, were bidding for the services of crewmen. Last off time is twenty one hundred tonight, he said, ending the interview. Be here. Johnner left the personnel office and walked down the hall. At the elevator, DeVeet and Kruger hurried out, almost colliding with him. Johnner, we've run into trouble, exclaimed DeVeet. Space fuels won't sell us any hydrazine and nitric acid to refill the tanks. They say they have a new contract with Mars Corp that takes all their supply. Contract, hell, snorted Johnner. Mars Corp owns space fuels. What can be done about it, Kruger? Kruger shook his head. I'm all for you, but space control has no jurisdiction, he said. If a private firm wants to restrict its sales to a franchised line, there's nothing we can do about it. If you had a franchise, we could force them to allot fuel on the basis of cargo handled since space fuels as a monopoly here. But you don't have a franchise yet. Johnner scratched his gray head thoughtfully. It was a serious situation. The atom-powered Radiant Hope could no more make a planetary landing than the chemically-powered ships. Its power gave a low, sustained thrust that permitted it to accelerate constantly over long periods of time. To beat the powerful pull of planetary surface gravity, the terrific burst of quick energy from the streamlined G-boats, the planetary landing craft, was needed. "'We can still handle it,' Johnner said at last. With only twenty tons return cargo, we can take it up this trip. Add some large parachutes to that, DeVete. We'll shoot the end of the cable down by signal rocket out in the lowlands and stop the winch when we've made contact long enough to attach the rest of the cargo to the cable. Pull it down with the cable, and with Mars's low gravity, the parachutes will keep it from being damaged. But when Johnner got back to the landing field to check on unloading operations, his plan was smashed. As he approached the G-boat, a mechanic wearing an ill-concealed smirk came up to him. "'Captain, looks like you sprung a leak in your fuel line,' he said. "'All your hydrazines leaked out in the sand.' Johnner swung from the waist and knocked the man flat. Then he turned on his heel and went back to the administration building to pay the ten-credit fine he would be assessed for assaulting a spaceport employee. The Space Control Commission's hearing room in Mars City was almost empty. The examiner sat on the bench, resting his chin on his hand as he listened to testimony. In the plaintiff's section sat Johnner, flanked by DeVeet and Lana Eldon. In the defense box were the Mars Corporation attorney and Captain Russo Beat of the Marsward 18. Kruger, seated near the rear of the room, was the only spectator. The Mars Corporation attorney had succeeded in delaying the final hearing more than a forty-two-day Martian month by legal maneuvers. Meanwhile, the Marsward 18 had blasted down to Phobos, and G-boats had been shuttling back and forth, unloading the vessel and reloading it for the return trip to Earth. When testimony had been completed, the examiner shuffled through his papers. He put on his spectacles and peered over them at the litigants. It is the ruling of this court, he said formally, that the plaintiffs have not presented sufficient evidence to prove tampering with the fuel line of the G-boat of the spaceship Radiant Hope. There is no evidence that it was cut or burned, but only that it was broken. The court must remind the plaintiffs that this could have been done accidentally through inept handling of cargo. Since the plaintiffs have not been able to prove their contention, this court of complaint has no alternative than to dismiss the case. The examiner arose and left the hearing room. Bayat waddled across the aisle, puffing. Too bad, Johnner, he said. I don't like the stuff Mars Corp's pulling, and I think you know I don't have anything to do with it. I want to win, but I want to win fair and square. If there's anything I can do to help, "'Haven't got a spare G-boat in your pocket, have you?' retorted Johnner with a rueful smile. Bayot pulled at his jowls. "'The Marsward isn't carrying G-boats,' he said regretfully. "'They all belong to the port, and Mars Corp's got them so tied up you'll never get a sniff of one. "'But if you want to get back to your ship, Johnner, I can take you up to Phobos with me as my guest.' Johnner shook his head. I figure on taking the Radiant Hope back to Earth, he said, but I'm not blasting off without cargo until it's too late for me to beat you on the run. 
You sure? This'll be my last ferry trip. The Marsward blasts off for Earth at 0300 tomorrow. No, thanks, Russo. But I will appreciate you taking my ship's doctor, Dr. Eldon, up to Phobos. Done, agreed Bayat. Let's go, Dr. Eldon. The G-boat leaves Marsport in two hours. Johnner watched Bayat puff away with the slender, white-clad brunette at his side. Bayat personally would see Lana Eldon safely aboard the Radiant Hope, even if it delayed his own blast-off. Morosely, he left the hearing room with Devite. "'What I can't understand,' said the latter, "'is why all this dirty work? Why didn't Mars Corp just use one of their atom-drive ships for the competition run?' "'Because whatever ship is used on a competition run has to be kept in service on the franchised run,' answered Johnner. "'Mars Corp has millions tied up in hydrazine interests, and they're more interested in keeping an atomic ship off this run than they are in a Monopoly franchise. But they tie in together. If Mars Corp loses the Monopoly franchise and Atom Star puts in Atom Drive ships, Mars Corp will have to switch to Atom Drive to meet the competition. If we had a franchise, we could force Space Fuels to sell us hydrazine, said Devite unhappily. Well, we don't. And at this rate, we'll never get one. Johnner and Devitt were fishing at the Mars City Recreation Center. It had been several weeks since the Marsward 18 blasted off to Earth with a full cargo, and still the atomic ship Radiant Hope rested on Phobos with most of her Mars-bound cargo still aboard, and still her crew languished at the Phobos space station, and still Johnner moved back and forth between Mars City and Marsport daily, racking his brain for a solution that would not come. How in space do you get twenty tons of cargo up to an orbit fifty-eight hundred miles out without any rocket fuel? he demanded of Devite more than once. He received no satisfactory answer. The recreation center was a two-acre park that lay beneath the plastic dome of Mars City. Above them they could see swift-moving Phobos and distant Deimos among the other stars that powdered the night. In the park around them, Colonists rode the amusement machines, canoed along the canal that twisted through the park, or sipped refreshment at scattered tables. A dozen or more sat, like Johnner and Devit, around the edge of the tiny lake, fishing. Devit's line tightened. He pulled in a streamlined, flapping object from which the light glistened wetly. "'Good catch,' complimented Johnner. "'That's where the full credit.' Devite unhooked his catch and laid it on the bank beside him. It was a metal fish. Live fish were unknown on Mars. They paid for the privilege of fishing for a certain time, and any fish caught were sold back to the management at a fixed price, depending on size, to be put back into the lake. "'You're pretty good at it,' said Johnner. "'That's your third tonight.' "'It's all in the speed at which you reel in your line,' explained Devite. "'The fish move at preset speeds.' They're made to turn and catch a hook that moves across their path at a slightly slower speed than their swimming. The management changes the speeds once a week to keep the fishermen from getting too expert. <laughs> you can't beat the management, chuckled Johnner. But if it's a matter of matching orbital speeds to make contact, I ought to do pretty well when I get the hang of it. He cocked an eye up toward the transparent dome. Phobos had moved across the sky into Capricorn since he last saw her. His memory automatically ticked off the satellite's orbital speed, 1.32 miles a second speed in relation to planetary motion. Why go over that again? One had to have fuel first. Meanwhile, the Radiant Hope lay idle on Phobos, and its crew whiled away the hours at the space station inside the moon, their feet spinning faster than their heads. No, that wasn't true on Phobos, because it didn't have a spin to impart artificial gravity like the space stations around Earth. He sat up suddenly. Devite looked at him in surprise. Johnner's lips moved silently for a moment, then he got to his feet. "'Where can we use a radio phone?' he asked. "'One in my office,' said Devite, standing up. "'Let's go, quick, before Phobos sets.' They turned in their rods, Devite collecting the credits for his fish, and left the recreation center— 
When they reached the Atom Star Company's Martian office, Jonner plugged in the radio phone and called the Phobos space station. He got tan. All of you get aboard, Jonner ordered, then have Kokul call me. He signed off and turned to DeVete. Can we charter a plane to haul our earthbound cargo out of Marsport? A plane? I suppose so. Where do you want to haul it? Charax is as good as any other place, but I need a fast plane. I think we can get it. Mars Corp still controls all the airlines, but the Mars government keeps a pretty strict finger on their planet-bound operations. They can't refuse a cargo haul without good reason. Just to play safe, have some friend of yours whom they don't know charter the plane in his name. They won't know it's us till we start loading cargo. Right, said Devite, picking up the telephone. I know just the man. Tow motors scuttled across the landing area at Marsport, shifting the cargo that had been destined for the Radiant Hope from the helpless G-boat to a jet cargo plane. Nearby, watching the operation, were Jonner and Devite, with the Marsport agent of Mars Air Transport Company. We didn't know Atom Star was the one chartering the plane until you ordered the G-boat cargo loaded on it, confessed the Mars Air agent. I see you and Mr. DeVete are signed up to accompany the cargo. You'll have to rent suits for the trip. We have to play it safe, and there's always the possibility of a forced landing. There are a couple of space suits aboard the G-boat that we want to take along, said Jonner casually. We'll just wear those instead. Okay, the agent spread his hands and shrugged. Everybody in Marsport knows about you bucking Mars Corp, Captain. What you expect to gain by transferring your cargo to Charax is beyond me, but it's your business. An hour later, the chartered airplane took off with a thunder of jets. Aboard was the twenty-ton cargo the Radiant Hope was supposed to carry to Earth, plus some large parachutes. The Mars Air pilot wore a light suit with a plastic helmet designed for survival in the thin, cold Martian air. Jonner and DeVete wore the bulkier spacesuits. Five minutes out of Marsport, Jonner thrust the muzzle of a heat gun in the pilot's back. Set it on automatic, strap on your parachute, and bail out, he ordered. We're taking over. The pilot had no choice. He went through the plane's airlock and jumped, helped by a hearty boost from Jonner. His parachute blossomed out as he drifted down toward the green Sirtis Major lowland. Jonner didn't worry about him. He knew the pilot's helmet radio would reach Marsport and a helicopter would rescue him shortly. "'I don't know what you're trying to do, Jonner,' said David apprehensively over his space helmet radio. "'But whatever it is, you'd better do it fast. They'll have every plane on Mars looking for us in half an hour.' "'Let them look, and keep quiet a while,' retorted Jonner. "'I've got some figuring to do.' He put the plane on automatic, took off the spacesuit handhooks, and scribbled figures on a scrap of paper. He tuned in the plane's radio and called Kokol on Phobos. They talked to each other briefly in Martian. The darker green line of a canal crossed the green lowland below them. Good. There's Drosinus, muttered Jonner. Let's see. Time, 1424 hours. Speed, 660 miles an hour. Jonner boosted the jets a bit and watched the terrain. By Saturn, I almost overran it, he exclaimed. Devite, smash out those ports. Break out the ports, repeated Devite. That'll depressurize the cabin. That's right. So you'd better be sure your spacesuit's secure. Obviously puzzled, Devite strode up and down the cabin, knocking out its six windows with the hand hooks of his spacesuit. Jonner maneuvered the plane gently and set it on automatic. He got out of the pilot's seat and strode to the right front port. Reaching through the broken window, he pulled in a section of cable that was trailing alongside. While the baffled DeVete watched, he reeled it in until he brought up the end of it, to which was attached a fish-shaped finned metal missile. Jonner carried the cable end and the attached missile across the cabin and tossed it out the broken front port on the other side, swinging it so that the 700-mile-an-hour slipstream snapped it back in through the rearmost port like a bullet. Pick it up and pass it out the right rear port, he commanded. We'll have to pass it to each other from port to port. The slipstream won't let us swing it forward and through. In a few moments, 
the two of them had worked the missile and the cable end to the right front port and in through it originating above the plane and now made a loop through the four open ports Jonner untied the missile and tied the end to the portion which came into the cabin, making a bowline knot of the loop. Devite picked up the missile from the floor where Jonner had thrown it. "'Looks like a spent rocket shell,' he commented. "'It's a signal rocket,' said Jonner. The flare trigger was disconnected. He picked up the microphone and called the Radiant Hope on Phobos. "'We've hooked our fish, Kokol,' he told the Martian, and laid the mic aside. "'What does that mean?' asked Devit. "'Means we'd better strap in,' said Jonner, suiting the action to the words. "'You're in for a short trip to Phobos, Devit. Jonner pulled back slowly on the elevator control, and the plane began a shallow climb. At seven hundred miles an hour it began to attain a height at which its broad wings, broader than those of any terrestrial plane, would not support it. "'I'm trying to decide,' said Devit, with forced calm, "'whether you've flipped your helmet.' "'Nope,' answered Jonner. "'Trolling for those fish in Mars City gave me the idea. "'The rest was no more than an astrogation problem, "'like any rendezvous with a ship in a fixed orbit, "'which Kokol could figure. "'Remember that six-thousand-mile television cable the ship's hauling? "'Kokol just shot the end of it down to Mars' surface by a signal rocket. "'We hooked on.' and now he'll haul us up to Phobos. He's got the ship's engine hooked onto the cable winch. The jets coughed and stopped. The plane was out of fuel. It was on momentum to be drawn by the cable, or to snap it and fall. Impossible, cried David in alarm. Phobos's orbital speed is more than a mile a second. No cable can take the sudden difference in that and the speed we're traveling. When the slack is gone, it'll break. The slack's gone already. You're thinking of the speed of Phobos at Phobos. At this end of the cable, we're like the head of a man in the control section of a space station which is traveling slower than his feet because its orbit is smaller, but it revolves around the center in the same time. Look, Jonner added, I'll put it in round numbers. Figure your cable as part of a radius of Phobos's orbit. Phobos travels at 1.32. But the other end of the radius travels at zero because it's at the center. The cable end, at the Martian surface, travels at a speed in between, roughly 1,200 miles an hour. But it keeps up with Phobos's revolution. Since the surface of Mars itself rotates at 500 miles an hour, all I had to do was boost the plane up to 700 to match the speed of the cable end. That cable will haul a hell of a lot more than 20 tons, and that's all that's on it right now. By winching us up slowly, there'll never be too great a strain on it. Devite looked apprehensively out of the port. The plane was hanging sidewise now, and the distant Martian surface was straight out the left-hand ports. The cable was holding. We can make the trip to Earth eighty-three days faster than the Marsward, said Jonner, and they have only about twenty days' start. It won't take us but a few days to make Phobos and get this cable and the rest of the cargo shot back to Mars. Atom Star will get its franchise, and you'll see all spaceships switching to the atomic drive within the next decade. How about this plane? asked Devite. We stole it, you know. You can hire a G-boat to take it back to Marsport, said Jonner with a chuckle. Pay Mars Air for the time and the broken ports and settle out of court with that pilot we dropped. I don't think they'll send you to jail, Devite. He was silent for a few minutes. By the way, Devite, said Jonner then, Radio Atom Star to buy some Flonite cable of their own and ship it to Phobos. Damned if I don't think this is cheaper than G-boats. End of Atom Drive Recording by Thomas Rose The Attics by William Morrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Attics by William Morrison. You must understand that Palmer loved his wife as much as ever, or he never would have thought of his simple little scheme at all. It was entirely for her own good.
as he had told himself a dozen times in the past day and with that he stilled whatever qualms of conscience he might otherwise have had he didn't think of himself as being something of a murderer she was sitting at the artificial fireplace a cheerful relic of ancient days reading just as peacefully as if she had been back home on mars instead of on this desolate outpost of space she had adjusted quickly to the loneliness and the strangeness of this life to the absence of friends the need for conserving air the strange feeling of an artificial gravity that varied slightly at the whim of impurities in the station fuel to everything in fact but her husband she seemed to sense his eyes on her for she looked up and smiled feeling all right dear she asked naturally how about you as well as can be expected not very good then she didn't reply and he thought she hates to admit it but she really envies me well i'll fix it so that she needn't any more and he stared through the thick transparent metal window at the beauty of the stars their light undimmed by dust or atmosphere the stories told about the wretchedness of the lighthouse keepers who lived on asteroids didn't apply at all to this particular bit of cosmic rock life here had been wonderful incredibly satisfying at least it had been that way for him and now it would be the same way for his wife as well he would have denied it hotly if you had accused him of finding her repulsive but to certain drunks the sober man or woman is an offence and palmer was much more than a drunk he was a marac addict and in the eyes of the marac fiends all things and all people were wonderful except those who did not share their taste for the drug the latter were miserable depraved creatures practically subhuman of course that was not the way most of them put it certainly it was not the way palmer did he regarded his wife he told himself as an unfortunate individual whom he loved very much one whom it was his duty to make happy that her newfound happiness would also hasten her death was merely an unfortunate coincidence she was sure to die anyway before long so why not have her live out her last days in the peace and contentment that only marac could bring louise herself would have had an answer to that if he had ever put the question to her he was careful never to do so she laid the book aside and looked up at him again she said jim darling do you think you could get the television set working again not without a mesotron rectifier <sighs> even the radio would be a comfort it wouldn't do any good anyway too much static from both mars and earth this time of year that was the beauty of the marac he thought it changed his mood and left him calm and in full command of his faculties able to handle any problem that came up he himself of course missed neither the radio nor the television and he never touched the fine library of micro books he didn't need them a shadow flitted by outside the thick window blotting out for a moment the blaze of stars it was the shadow of death as he knew and he was able to smile even at that even death was wonderful when it finally came it would find him happy he would not shudder away from it as he saw louise doing now at the sight of the ominous shadow he smiled at his wife again remembering the six years they had lived together it had been a short married life but again that word suggested itself to him a wonderful one there had been only one quarrel of importance in the second year and after that they had got along perfectly and then two years ago he had begun to take marac and after that he couldn't have quarrelled with any one it was a paragon among drugs and it was one of the mysteries of his existence that anybody should object to his using it louise had tried to argue with him after she had found out but he had turned every exchange of views into a peaceful discussion which from his side at least was brimming over with good humour he had even been good-humoured when she had tried to slip the antidote into his food it was this attitude of his that had so often left her baffled and enraged and he had a good chuckle out of that too imagine a wife getting angry because her husband was too good-natured but she was never going to get angry again he would see to that not after tonight a big change was going to take place in her life she had picked up another book and for the moment he pitied her he knew that she wasn't interested in any books she was merely restless looking for something to do with herself seeking some method of killing time before the shadows outside killed it for her for good and all she couldn't understand his being so peaceful and contented doing nothing at all she threw the second book down and snarled yes that was the word 
you're such a fool jim you sit there smug and sure of yourself your mind blank just waiting waiting for them to kill you and me and you seem actually happy when i mention it i'm happy at anything and everything dear at the thought of dying too living or dying it doesn't make any difference whatever happens i'm incapable of being unhappy if it weren't for the drug we'd both live you'd think of a way to kill them before they killed us there is no way there must be you just can't think of it while the drug has you in its grip the drug doesn't have you dear he asked without sarcasm why don't you think of a way because i lack the training you have because i don't have the scientific knowledge and all the equipment scattered around means nothing to me there's nothing to be done her fists clenched if you weren't under the influence of the drug you know that it doesn't affect the ability to think tests have shown that tests conducted by addicts themselves the fact that they can conduct the test should be proof enough that there's nothing wrong with their minds but there is she shouted i can see it in you oh i know that you can still add and subtract and you can draw lines under two words which mean the same thing but that isn't really thinking really thinking means the ability to tackle real problems hard problems that you can't handle merely with paper and pencil it means having the incentive to use your brain for a long time at a stretch and that's what the drug has ruined it has taken away all your incentive i still go about my duties not as well as you used to and even at that only because they've become a habit just as you talk to me because i've become a habit if you'd let me give you the antidote he chuckled at the absurdity of her suggestion once an addict had been cured he could not become addicted again the antidote acted to produce a permanent immunization against the effects of the drug it was the realization of this fact that made addicts fight so hard against any attempt to cure them and she thought that she could convince him by argument he said you talk of not being able to think i know she replied hotly i'm the one who blunders i'm the fool for arguing with you when i realize that it's impossible to convince a marac addict that's it he nodded and chuckled again but that wasn't quite it for he was also chuckling at his plan she had thought him unable to tackle a real problem well he would tackle one tonight then she would simply adopt his point of view and she would no longer be unhappy after she had accepted the solution he had provided she would wonder how she could ever have opposed him he fell into one of his dozes and hardly noticed her glaring at him when he came out of it at last it was to hear her say we have to stay alive as long as possible for the sake of the lighthouse of course my dear i don't dispute that at all and the longer we stay alive the more chance there is that some ship will pick us up oh no there's no chance of that at all he asserted cheerfully you know that as well as i do no use deceiving yourself my love that he observed to himself was the way of non-addicts they couldn't look facts in the face they had to cling to a blind and silly optimism which no facts justified he knew that there was no hope he was able to review the facts calmly judiciously to see the inevitability of their dying and to take pleasure even in that he reviewed them for her now let us see sweetheart whether i've lost my ability to analyze a situation we're here with our pretty little lighthouse in the middle of a group of asteroids between mars and earth ships have been wrecked here and our task is to prevent future wrecks the lighthouse sends out a standard high frequency beam whose intensity and phase permit astrogators to estimate their distance and direction from us ordinarily there's nothing for us to do but on the rare occasions when the beam fails that will be the end on those occasions he continued unruffled by her interruption i am supposed to leave my cosy little shelter so thoughtfully equipped with all the comforts of earth or mars and make repairs as rapidly as possible under the usual conditions lighthouse keeping is a boring task in fact it has been known to drive people insane that's why it's generally assigned to happily married couples like us who are accustomed to living quietly without excitement and that she added bitterly is why even happily married couples are usually relieved after one year but darling he said his tone cheerful you mustn't blame anyone who would have expected that a maverick meteor would come at us and displace us from our orbit and who would have expected that the meteor would have collided first with the outer asteroids and picked up a cargo of 
those. He gestured toward the window, where a shadow had momentarily paused. By the light that shone through, he could see that the creature was relatively harmless-looking. It had what appeared to be a round, humorous face, whose unhumorous intentions would be revealed only at the moment of the kill. The seeming face was actually featureless, for it was not a face at all. It had neither eyes, nor nose, nor mouth. The effect of features was given by the odd blend of colors. Almost escaping notice, because of their unusual position and their dull brown hue, were the stomach fangs, in neat rows, which could be extended and retracted, like those of a snake. He noticed that Louise had shuddered again, and said, in the manner of a man making conversation, Interesting, aren't they? They're rock breathers, you know. They need very little oxygen, and they extract that from the silicates and other oxygen-containing compounds of the rock. Don't talk about them. All right, if you don't want me to. But about us. You see, my dear, no one expected us to be lost. And even if the lighthouse service has started to look for us, it will take a long time to find us. We have food, water, air. If not for those beasts, we'd last until a rescue ship appeared. But even a rescue ship wouldn't be able to reach us unless we kept the beam going. So far, we've been lucky. It's really functioned remarkably well. But sooner or later, it'll go out of order, and then I'll have to go out and fix it. You agree to that, don't you, Louise, dear? She nodded. She said quietly, the beam must be kept in order. That's when the creatures will get me, he said, almost with satisfaction. I may kill one or two of them, although the way I feel toward everything, I hate to kill anything at all. But you know, sweetheart, that there are more than a dozen of them altogether, and it's clumsy, shooting in a spacesuit at beasts which move as swiftly as they do. And if you don't succeed in fixing what's wrong, if they get you... She broke down suddenly and began to cry. He looked at her with compassion and smoothed her hair, and yet, under the influence of the drug, he enjoyed even her crying. It was, as he never tired of repeating to himself and to her, a wonderful drug. Under its spell, a man or a woman could really enjoy life. Tonight, she would begin to enjoy life along with him. Their chronometer functioned perfectly, and they still regulated their living habits by it, using Greenwich Earth time. At seven in the evening, they sat down to a fine meal. Knowing that tomorrow they might die, Louise had decided that tonight they would eat and drink as well as they could, and she had selected a Christmas special. She had merely to pull a lever, and the food had slid into the oven to be cooked at once by an intense beam of high-frequency radiation. Jim himself had chosen the wine and the brandy. One of the peculiarities of the marac was that it did not affect the actual enjoyment of alcoholic drinks in the slightest, and one of the sights of the solar system was to see an addict who was also drunk. But it was a rare sight for the marac itself created such a pervading sensation of well-being that it often acted as a cure for alcoholism. Once an alcoholic had experienced its effect, he had no need to get drunk to forget his troubles. He enjoyed his troubles instead, and drank the alcohol for its own sake, for its ability to provide a slightly different sensation, and not for its ability to release him from an unhappy world. So tonight Palmer drank moderately, taking just enough, as it seemed to him, to stimulate his brain. And he did what he now realized he should have done long ago. Unobserved, he placed a tablet of marac in his own wine glass and one in Louise's. The slight bitterness of taste would be hardly perceptible. And after that, Louise would be an addict too. That was the way the marac worked. There was nothing mysterious about the craving. It was simply that once you had experienced how delightful it was, you wouldn't do without it. The tablet he had taken that morning was losing its effect, but he felt so pleased at what he was doing that he didn't mind even that. For the next half hour, he would enjoy himself simply by looking at Louise and thinking that now at last they would be united again, no longer kept apart by her silly ideas about doing something to save themselves. And then the drug would take effect, and they would feel themselves lifted to the stars together, never to come down to this substitute for Earth again until the beam failed and they went out together to make the repairs, and the shadows closed in on them. He had made sure that Louise had her back to him when he dropped the tablet into her glass, and he saw that she suspected nothing. She drank her wine, he noticed, without even commenting on the taste. He felt a sudden impulse to kiss her, and somewhat to her surprise, he did so. Then he sat down again and went on with the dinner. He waited. An hour later, he knew that he had made her happy. She was laughing as she hadn't laughed for a long time, 
she laughed at the humorous things he said at the flattering way he raised his glass to her even at what she saw through the window sometimes it seemed to him that she was laughing at nothing at all he tried to think of how he had reacted the first time he had taken the drug he hadn't been quite so aggressively cheerful not quite so hysterical but then the drug didn't have exactly the same effect on everyone she wasn't as well balanced as he had been the important thing was that she was happy curiously enough he himself wasn't happy at all it took about five seconds for the thought to become clear to him five seconds in which he passed from dull amazement to an enraged and horrified comprehension he sprang to his feet overturning the table at which they still sat and he saw that she wasn't surprised at all that she still stared at him with a secret satisfaction you've cured me he cried you've fed me the antidote and he began to curse he remembered the other time she had tried it the time when he had been on the alert and had easily detected the strange metallic taste of the stuff he had spat it out and under the influence of the drug from which she had hoped to save him he had laughed at her now he was unable to laugh he had been so intent on feeding the tablet to her that he had forgotten to guard himself and he had been caught he was normal now her idea of being normal and he would never again know the wonderful feeling the drug gave he began to realize his situation on this horrible lonely asteroid he cast a glance at the window and at what must be waiting outside and it was his turn to shudder he noticed that she was still smiling he said bitterly you're the addict now and i'm cured she stopped smiling and said quietly jim listen to me you're wrong completely wrong i didn't give you the antidote and you didn't give me the drug i put it in your wine glass myself she shook her head that was a tablet i substituted for yours it's an antivirus dose from our medicine chest you took one of the same things that's why you feel so depressed you're not under the influence of the drug any more he took a deep breath but i'm not cured no i knew that i wouldn't be able to slip you the antidote the taste is too strong later you'll be able to start taking the drug again that is if you want to after experiencing for a time what it is to be normal but not now you have to keep your head clear you have to think of something to save us but there's nothing to think of he shouted angrily i told you that the drug doesn't affect the intelligence i still don't believe you if you'd only exert yourself use your mind he said savagely i'm not going to bother give me those marac tablets she backed away from him i thought she might want them i took no chances i threw them out out there a horrified and incredulous look was on his face you mean that i'm stuck here without them louise you fool there's no help for us the other way at least we'd have died happy but now he stared out the window the shadows were there in full force not one now but two three he counted half a dozen it was almost as if they knew that the end had come they had reason to be happy he thought with despair and perhaps he shrank back from the thought but it forced itself into his mind perhaps now that all happiness had gone and wretchedness had taken its place he might as well end everything there would be no days to spend torturing himself in anticipation of a horrible death louise exclaimed suddenly jim look they're frolicking he looked the beasts certainly were gay one of them leaped from the airless surface of the asteroid and sailed over its fellow he had never seen them do that before usually they clung to the rocky surface another was spinning around oddly as if it had lost its sense of balance louise said they've swallowed the tablets over a hundred doses enough to drug every beast on the asteroid for a moment palmer stared at the gamboling alien drug addicts then he put on his spacesuit and took his gun and without the slightest danger to himself went out and shot them one by one he noted with a kind of grim envy that they died happy end of the addicts by william morrison recording by colleen mcmahon a bad day for vermin by keith laumer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. They came in friendship and love. They couldn't help the way they looked. A Bad Day for Vermin by Keith Laumer. Judge Carter Gates of the Third Circuit Court finished his chicken salad on whole wheat, thoughtfully crumpled up the wax paper bag, and turned to drop it in the wastebasket behind his chair, and sat transfixed. Through his second-floor office window he saw a forty-foot flower-petal shape of pale turquoise settling gently between the well-tended petunia beds on the courthouse lawn. On the upper, or stem, end of the vessel, a translucent pink panel popped up, and a slender, graceful form, not unlike a large violet caterpillar, undulated into view. Judge Gates whirled to the telephone. Half an hour later, he put it to the officials gathered with him in a tight group on the lawn. Boys, this thing is intelligent. Any fool can see that. It's putting together what my boys assure me is some kind of talking machine, and any minute now it's going to start communicating. It's been twenty minutes since I notified Washington on this thing. It won't be long before somebody back there decides this is top secret and slaps a freeze on us here that will make the Manhattan Project look like a publicity campaign. Now I say that this is the biggest thing that ever happened to Plum County, but if we don't aim to be put right out of the picture, we'd better move fast. What do you got in mind, Judge? I propose that we hold an open hearing right here in the courthouse, the minute the thing gets its gear to working. We'll put it on the air. Tom Clembers at the radio station's already stringing wires, I see. Too bad we got no TV equipment. But Jody Heard has a movie camera. We'll put Willow Grove on the map bigger than Cape Canaveral ever was. We're with you on that, Carter. Ten minutes after the melodious voice of the Fianna's translator had requested escort to the village headman, the visitor was looking over the crowded courtroom with an expression reminiscent of a St. Bernard puppy hoping for a romp. The rustle of feet and throat clearing subsided and the speaker began. People of the green world, happy the cycle. Heads turned at the heavy clump of feet coming down the side aisle. A heavy torsoed man of middle age, bald, wearing a khaki shirt and trousers, and rimless glasses, and with a dark leather holster slapping his hip at each step, cleared the end of the front row of seats, planted himself, feet apart, yanked the heavy nickel-plated forty-four revolver from its holster, took aim and fired five shots into the body of the Fianna at a range of ten feet. The violet form whipped convulsively, writhed from the bench to the floor, with a sound like a wet fire hose being dropped, uttered a gasping twitter, and lay still. The gunman turned, dropped the pistol, threw up his hands and called, Sure, Hoskins, I'm putting myself in your protective custody. There was a moment of stunned silence, then a rush of spectators for the alien. The sheriff's three hundred and nine pound bulk bellied through the shouting mob to take up a stand before the khaki clad man. Always knew you was a mean one, Cecil Stump, he said, unlimbering handcuffs. Ever since I seen you making up them ground glass baits for Joe Potter's dog but I never thought I'd see you turn to cold-blooded murder. He waved at the bystanders. Clear a path through here. I'm taking my prisoner over to the jail. Just a dad blame minute, Sheriff. Stamp's face was pale. His glasses were gone, and one of the khaki shoulder straps dangled. But what was almost a grin twisted one meaty cheek. He hid his hands behind his back, leaned away from the cuffs. I don't like the word prisoner. I ask you for protection, and better look out who you're throwing the word murder off at, too. I ain't murdered nobody. The sheriff blinked and roared, How's the victim, Doc? A small gray-haired head rose from bending over the limp form of the Fianna. Deader to mackerel, sheriff. I guess that's it. Let's go, Cecil. 
What's the charge? First degree murder. Who'd I murder? Why you killed this here, this stranger? That ain't no stranger. That's a varmint. Murder's got to do with killing humans, way I understand it. You going to tell me that thing's human? Ten people shouted at once. Human as I am, intelligent being. Tell me you can simply kill. Must be some kind of law. The sheriff raised his hands, his jowls drawn down in a scowl. What about it, Judge Gates? Any law against Cecil Stump killing the, uh... The judge thrust out his lower lip. Well, let's see, he began. Technically. Good Lord, somebody blurted. You mean the laws on murder don't define what constitutes, I mean, what? What a human is, Stump snorted. Whatever it says, it sure Bob don't include no purple worm. That's a varmint, pure and simple. Ain't no difference killing it than any other critter. Then by God, we'll get him on malicious damage, the man called, or hunting without a license, out of season, carrying concealed weapons. Stump went for his hip pocket, fumbled out a fat, shapeless wallet, extracted a thumbed rectangle of folded paper, offered it. I'm a licensed exterminator. Got a permit to carry a gun, too. I ain't broke no law. He grinned openly now. Just doing my job, Sheriff, and at no charge to the county. A smaller man with bristling red hair flared his nostrils at Stump. You bloodthirsty idiot, he raised his fist and shook it, will be a national disgrace, worse than Little Rock. Lynching's too good for you. Hold on there, Weinstein, the sheriff cut in. Let's not go getting no lynch talk started. Lynch, is it? Cecil Stump bellowed, his face suddenly red. Why, I done a favor for every man here. Now you listen to me. What is that thing over there? He jerked a blunt thumb toward the judicial bench. It's some kind of critter from Mars or some place. You know that as well as me. And what's it here for? It ain't for the good of the likes of you or me, I can tell you that. It's them or us. And this time, by God, we got in the first lick. Why, you, you hate monger? Now hold on right there. I'm as liberal-minded as the next feller. Hell, I like a nigger. And I can't hardly tell a Jew from a white man. But when it comes to taking in a damn purple worm and calling it humorin', that's where I draw the line. Sheriff Hoskins pushed between Stump and the surging front rank of the crowd. Stay back there. I want you to disperse peaceably and let the law handle this. I reckon I'll push off now, Sheriff, Stump hitched up his belt. I figured you might have to calm him down right at first, but now they've had a chance to think it over, and see I ain't broke no law. Ain't none of these law-abiding folks going to do anything illegal, like trying to get rough with a licensed exterminator just doing his job. He stood, retrieved his gun. Here, I'll take that, Sheriff Hoskins said. You can consider your gun license canceled. And your exterminating license, too. Stump grinned again and handed the revolver over. Sure, I'm cooperative, Sheriff. Anything you say. Send it around to my place when you're done with it. He pushed his way through the crowd to the corridor door. The rest of you stay put, a portly man with a head of bushy white hair pushed his way through to the bench. I'm calling an emergency town meeting to order here and now. He banged the gavel on the scarred bench top, glanced down at the body of the dead alien, now covered by a flag. Gentlemen, we've got to take fast action. If the wire services get hold of this before we've gone on the record, Willow Grove will be a blighted area. Look here, Willard, Judge Gates said, rising. This mob isn't competent to take legal action. Never mind what's legal, Judge. Sir, this calls for federal legislation. 
may be a constitutional amendment. But in the meantime, we're going to redefine what constitutes a person within the incorporated limits of Willow Grove. That's the last thing we can do, a thin-faced woman snapped, glaring at Judge Gates. Do you think we're going to sit here and condone this outrage? Nonsense, Gates shouted. I don't like what happened any better than you do. But a person, well, a person's got two arms and two legs and... Shapes got nothing to do with it, the chairman cut in. Bears walk on two legs. Dave Zawaki lost his in the war. Monkeys have hands. Any intelligent creature, the woman started. Nope, that won't do either. My unfortunate cousin's boy, Melvin, was born an imbecile. Poor lad. Now, folks, there's no time to waste. We'll find it very difficult to formulate a satisfactory definition based on considerations such as these. However, I think we can resolve the question in terms that will form a basis for future legislation on the question. It's going to make some big changes in things. Hunters ain't gonna like it and the meat industry will be affected. But if, as it appears, we're entering into an era of contact with, uh, creatures from other worlds, we gotta get our house in order. You tell em, Senator, somebody yelled. We better leave this for Congress to figure out, another voice insisted. We got to do something. The Senator held up his hands. Quiet, everybody. There'll be reporters here in a matter of minutes. Maybe our ordinance won't hold water, but it'll start em thinking, and it'll make a lot better copy for Willow Grove than the killing. What do you got in mind, Senator? This is, the Senator said solemnly, a person is any harmless creature. Pete shuffled. Somebody coughed. What about a man who commits a violent act, then? Judge Gates demanded. What's he, huh? That's obvious, gentlemen, the senator said flatly. He's vermin. On the courthouse steps, Cecil Stump stood, hands in hip pockets, talking to a reporter from the big town paper in Mattoon, surrounded by a crowd of latecomers who had missed the excitement inside. He described the accuracy of his five shots, the sound they made hitting the big blue snake, and the ludicrous spectacle the latter had presented in its death agony. He winked at the foxy man in overalls, picking his nose on the edge of the crowd. Guess it'll be a while for any more damn reptiles move in here like they own the place, he concluded. The courthouse doors banged wide. Excited citizens poured forth, veering aside from Cecil Stump. The crowd around him thinned broke up as its members collared those emerging with the hot news. The reporter picked a target. Perhaps you'd care to give me a few details of the action taken by the, um, special committee, sir? Senator Custis pursed his lips. A session of the town council was called, he said. We've defined what a person is in this town. Stump, standing ten feet away, snorted, can't touch me with no ex post factory law. And also, what can be classified as vermin, Custis went on. Stump closed his mouth with a snap. Here, that's supposed to be some kind of slam at me, Custis. By God, come election time. Above, the door opened again. A tall man in a leather jacket stepped out, stood looking down. The crowd pressed back. Senator Custis and the reporter moved aside. The newcomer came down the steps slowly. He carried Cecil Stump's nickel-plated forty-four in his hand. Standing alone now, Stump watched him. Here, he said. His voice carried a sudden note of strain. Who are you? The man reached the foot of the steps, raised the revolver, and cocked it with a thumb. I'm the new exterminator said. End of A Bad Day for Vermin by Keith Laumer Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman You hear a lot of talk these days about secret weapons. If it's not a new wrinkle in nuclear fission, it's a gun to shoot around corners and down winding staircases. Or maybe a nice new strain of bacteria guaranteed to give you radioactive dandruff. Our own suggestion is to pipe a few of our television commercials into Russia and bore the enemy to death. Well, it seems that Ivar Jorgensen has hit on the ultimate engine of destruction, a weapon designed to exploit man's greatest weakness. The blueprints can be found in the next few pages. And as the soldier in the story says, our only hope is to keep a sense of humor. Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett me i'm looking for my outfit got cut off in the holland tunnel attack mind if i sit down with you guys a while thanks coffee damn this is heaven ain't seen a cup of coffee in a year what you said it this sure is a hell of a war tough on a guy's feet yeah that's right holland tunnel skirmish where the ruskies used that new gun uh god it was awful guys popping off all around a guy and him not knowing why no sense to it no noise no wound just popping off that's the trouble with this war it won't settle down to a routine always something new what the hell chance has a guy got to figure things out and i tell you them Ruskies are coming up with new weapons just as fast as we are. Enough to make your hair stand on end. Sugar? Christ, yes. Ain't seen sugar for a year. You see, it's like this. We were bottled up in the pits around the tunnel for seven damn days. It was like nothing you ever saw before. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to splash you. I was laughing about something that happened there. To a guy. Maybe you guys would get a kick out of it. After all, we got to keep our sense of humor. You see, there was me and a Kentucky kid named Stillwell in this pit. A big pit with lots of room, and we were all alone. This Stillwell was a nice kid, green and lonesome, and it's pretty sad, really, but there's a yak in it, and I say we got to keep a sense of humor. Well, this Stillwell, a really green kid, is unhappy and just plain drooling for his gal back home. He talks about his mother, of course, and his old man, but it's the girl that's really on his mind, as you guys can plainly understand. He's seeing her every place, like spots in front of his eyes, nice spots, doing things to him, when this rusky babe shows up. My gun came up, without any orders from me, just as she poked her puss over the edge of the pit, and, huh? Oh, thank you kindly. It sure tastes good, but I don't want to short you guys. Thank you kindly. Well, as I said, this rusky babe pokes her nose over the edge of the pit, and Stillwell dives and knocks down my gun. He says, you son of a bitch, just like that, wild and desperate. Like you'd say to a guy, if a guy was just kicking over the last jug of water on a desert island. It would have been long enough for her to kill us if I hadn't had good reflexes. Even then, all I had time to do was knock the pistol out of her hand and drag her into the pit. With her play bollocks, she was confused and bewildered. She ain't a fighter, and she sits back against the wall staring at us deadpan, with big expressionless eyes. She's a pretty babe, too, and I could see exactly what had happened as far as Stillwell was concerned. His spots had come to life, in very adequate form, so to speak. Stillwell goes over and sits down beside her, and I'm very much on alert because I know where his courage comes from. But I decide it's all right because I see the babe is not belligerent, just confused, kind of, and friendly, and willing. Kind of a whipped little dog willing, and man, oh man, 
she was sure what Stillwell needed. They kind of went together, like a hand and a glove. Natural like. And it followed, pretty natural, that when Stillwell got up and led her around to the wing of the pit, out of sight, she went willingly. Like the same little dog. Uh-uh, no, you guys, two's enough. I wouldn't rob you. Well, okay, and thanks kindly. Well, there I was, all alone and happy for Stillwell, because I know it's what the kid needs. And in spots like that, what difference does it make? Yank, Rusky, Mongolian? As long as she's willing. Then, you guys, Stillwell comes back out. Walleye. Real walleye like being hit but not knocked out and still walking. I know what it is, some kind of shock. I get up and walk over and take a look at the babe where he'd left her, and I bust out laughing. I told you guys there was a yak in this. I laughed like a fool. It was that funny, as much as I had time to before Stillwell cracked. It was enough to crack him, the little thing that pushes the guy over the edge. He lets out a yell and screams, For Christ's sake! For Christ's sake! Nothing but a bucket of bolts! Nothing but a couple of plastic lumps! That was when I hit him. I had to. He was for the bird, Stillwell was. An hour later we got relieved, and a couple of the medicos carried him away, strapped to a stretcher. Gone like a kite. They took the robot, too, and its clothes, but they forgot the brassiere. So I took it, and I've been carrying it ever since. And I'll leave it with you guys, if you want, for the coffee. Might make you think about home. After all, like the man said, we got to keep our sense of humor. Well, so long, you guys, and thanks. The End of Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett Felony by James O. Causey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Vogel started with crossword puzzles and worked his way up to man's greatest enigma. Felony by James O. Causey. When he was nine, Vogel almost killed another boy who inadvertently scattered his half-completed jigsaw puzzle. At sixteen, he discovered the mysteries of the Danish gambit and cried. At twenty-two, he crouched in a foxhole on Okinawa, oblivious to the death bursting about him, squinting in a painful ecstasy at the tattered fragment of a newspaper on his knee. His sergeant screamed in agony then died at his elbow. Vogel's face lit up. Slay, he said happily, scribbling. As crossword puzzles go, it had been a toughie. At thirty he was production manager of Saks Fixtures. His men hated him. The general manager loved him. Tall, gaunt, and ruthless, he could glance at any detail print and instantly pinpoint the pattern of final assembly total man-hour budget, and the fabrication lead time. Once he made a mistake. On a $40,000 job lot, he estimated too high on production scrap. When the final assemblies were completed, they had two feet of bulb extension left over. It disturbed him. He spent that evening in his den brooding over chessmen. His wife left him alone. Personnel called that morning and apologized. No experience, but amazing shop aptitude. He's coming down to you for an interview. I want, Vogel said into the phone, three bench men by noon with shop experience. Personnel was sorry. Vogel snarled and hung up. Hello, please, sir, said a voice. Vogel stared icily. Meekness cowered in front of his desk. Meekness in the form of a small bird-like person with beseeching amber eyes. I am Emmenth, he said cringingly. 
Vogel eyed the olive skin, the cheekbones, the blue-black hair. Oh, wetback, he said. Three men short, and they send me wetbacks. You know sheet metal, Buster? I am not of the understanding, Ammoth offered. Experience, no, he beamed. Aptitude, yes. Fighting apoplexy, Vogel took him out into the shop. Ameth cringed at the howl of the air tools and punch presses. Vogel contemptuously took him by the arm and led him to a workbench, where a wizened persimmon of a man performed deft lightnings with rivets and air wrench. Benny, this is Ameth. He's new. Vogel pronounced it like a curse. Get him some goggles from the crib and a rivet gun. Vogel returned to his office scowling. The phone rang almost instantly. Boss, said Benny, he is from nothing. All thumbs with an air wrench, and he don't know Alclad from stainless. Be right out, Vogel said, hanging up. Before he had a chance to fire Ammonth, the fabrication super came in with a production problem. Vogel solved it but it was almost an hour before he returned to Benny's bench and stared. Ammonth was a blur of motion. His keller chattered like a live thing. A furious sweating Benny snapped at Vogel. You playing practical jokes? Look, this guy's gone crazy. He's fifty percent under standard. Tell him to slow down before I file a grievance. Ammonth beamed. I am of the aptitude, he said. A queer, deep tingle went through Vogel, the crystal delight of challenge he felt when confronted by an apparently impregnable fianchetto. That was the first day. A week later, Vogel was compiling a progress report from the completed shop travelers. Abruptly, he scowled at one traveler and then said, Charlie! Yes, sir, one of the planters said. Why didn't these galley panels go out for drop hammer? Charlie preened at the form and whistled. Somebody must have changed the planning sheet. Get me the story. Charlie went hurriedly out into the shop. Some time later he returned with a pale, dazed look. It's this guy in assembly, he said. Name is Ammonth. He didn't even read the traveler. Just looked at the attached detail print and decided to miter the edges, then reversed the flange with a weld. He threw the completed part on Vogel's desk. Go ahead. Check those tolerances, he said whitely. Right on the money. Vogel walked over to a calculator and figured. There was a dreamy expression in his eyes. He said softly, All fabrication in our own shop. A net savings of ninety-three cents per unit, or eight hundred dollars total. I believe you planned this item, Charlie. Vogel fired him. That same afternoon, Ammonth came into the office on Vogel's orders. Sir? Don't you know how to read a traveler? Vogel said sternly. It was a lucky accident. Ammonth looked terrified. I just read the print and did what seemed logical statement then very quiet question what happened to your accent the little man looked blank vogel took a slow deep breath i've got a material planning job open he said tightly three fifty to start interested for a moment he thought ammonth would lick his hand the little man took to planning sheets like a duck to water he poured feverishly over blueprints, turned out travelers in a steady flood. Vogel watched him. He went over to personnel, requested Ammonth's employment application, read it, and scowled. It was a masterpiece of anonymity. Birthplace, New York. Former occupation, laborer. Hobbies, none. He memorized Ammonth's address, and returned the application. Vogel always ate lunch in his office with his expediters. That noon, two of them got into an argument about the planets. I say there's life on Mars, 
Pete Stone insisted stubbornly. When the polar ice cap melts, the water runs along the canals, and traces of green from growing vegetation can be spotted. Which proves nothing, Harry Lamb yawned. Lamb was chief expediter. Man couldn't live there anyway. There's not enough oxygen. You would be amazed, Emmeth said quietly, at the adaptability of man. Vogel set down his thermos and leaned forward. You mean Martians, for instance, could live here, assuming they existed and had spaceships? Ameth's smile was infinitely bitter. Until they'd go mad. The talk turned to baseball. Vogel lit his pipe and gave Ameth a surreptitious glance. The little man slumped in the corner, bleak and withdrawn. It was delicious. Vogel left the shop and drove across town to Ameth's address. It turned out to be in an ancient rooming house on the west side. Mrs. Reardon, the landlady, was an apathetic woman who brightened when he asked her about Ameth. He moved in just three weeks ago, her face softened in recollection. He was like a lost dog coming in out of the rain. Couldn't hardly speak English, and he wanted me to trust him for the rent. I must have been crazy. Her nostrils flared. Not that he hasn't paid up. Are you a cop? Vogel nodded as he took out his wallet. In it was his honorary sheriff's badge, but he doubted if the woman would know the difference. She didn't. She led the way upstairs to Ameth's room, worrying, and Vogel assured her they were only looking for a hit-and-run witness, that it was strictly routine. Ameth's room was incredibly antiseptic, barren of pictures, ashtrays, dirty laundry, any of the normal masculine debris. Vogel got the stark impression of a convict's cell. In the bleak dresser were two pairs of socks, underwear, one tie. In the closet hung one white shirt, period. Everything wore an indefinable patina of newness. Two books graced the top of the dresser. Vogel recognized one of them, a text on fabrication and design, which Ameth had borrowed from his office. The other was a child's primer on English. He stays in his room almost every night, reads mostly, and he speaks English much better now, said Mrs. Reardon. A good tenant. I can't complain. He's quiet and clean. She described Ameth, and Vogel shook his head. Our man is about sixty with a beard, he said. Funny coincidence. It's a strange name. Mrs. Reardon agreed. Vogel drove back to the shop whistling. He did not go to his chess club that night, but went to the library instead. He read about flying saucers, about space travel, about the possibility of life on other planets. Sometimes he chuckled. Once he frowned deeply and bit his lip. That night in bed, listening to his wife's shallow breathing, he said, Alice? Yes? Suppose you were lost on a desert island. What would you do? I'd build a raft, she said sleepily. Vogel smiled into the darkness. The next day he made a systematic tour of the stockroom, scanning the racks of completed subassemblies, the gleaming fixture components, the rows of panels, brackets, extrusions, all waiting like soldiers to march from the stockroom into final assembly. Vogel suddenly grunted. There, half hidden behind a row of stainless steel basin assemblies, was a nine-inch bowl. He examined it. The bowl was heavy and shiny. There was no part number stamp, and the metal was not alclad, not stainless, not cad, nor zinc. Five small copper discs had been welded to the lower flange. Vogel carefully scraped off a sample with a file. Then he replaced the part in the stock rack and went into his office where he placed the sample in an envelope. That afternoon he ranged the shop like a hound. In the shipping crib he found a half-completed detail that struck a chord of strangeness. 
two twisted copper veins with a crumbled chop traveler signed by Emmett. The next operation specified furnace braids. Vogel squinted at the attached detail print. It was a current job number. He spent the next two hours in the Ozolid room, leafing through the print files. The job number called for a deep freeze showcase, and there were exactly 207 detailed drawings involved. Not one of them matched the print in shipping. After an almost silent dinner at home, he sat smoking his pipe, waiting for the phone to ring. It rang at eight. It's platinum, Carstairs said. Tim Carstairs was the night shift chemist. Anything wrong, Mr. Vogel? No, Vogel paused. Thanks, Tim. He hung up, glancing at his fingers. They were shaking. You, Alice said, look ready to call mate in three. I'm going over to the shop, he said, kissing her. Don't wait up. He was not surprised to see the light on in the parts control section. Amanth was writing planning sheets. I don't believe we authorized overtime, Vogel told him mildly, hanging up his coat. Just loose ends, Amanth's smile was nervous. Tying up those burden charts. I'm on my own time. I thought I'd set up next month's budget, Vogel sat at his desk. By the way, what did you do before you came here? Odd jobs, Emmett's lips twitched. Your family live on the coast? Sweat glistened on the little man's forehead. Ah, no, my folks passed on years ago. Cat and Mouse You've done good work lately, Vogel yawned, studying the progress chart on the wall. Behind him, he heard a soft exhalation of relief, the furtive rustle of papers, as Ameth cleaned off his desk. When Ameth finally left, Vogel went over to his desk and methodically ransacked the work-in-progress file. It took him two hours to find what he was looking for. 1. A schematic detail on graph paper, which resembled no type of circuit Vogel had ever seen. 2. Fourteen completed shop travelers, on which were typed clearly, call Emmeth upon completion. This was not unusual. Most expediters wanted to be notified when the hot part hit the inspection. The unusual part was that no inspection stamp had been placed opposite the final operation of inspected, identified, returned to stock. Ergo, Emmeth had inspected and stocked the parts himself. 3. A progress chart with dates, indicating four detail parts still remaining in a fabrication. Final assembly date, tomorrow. The following afternoon, Vogel sat alone in the conference room. The door opened, and Ameth came in. You sent for me, sir? Sit down, Ameth. Let's talk a while. Ameth sat down uneasily. We're considering you for promotion, Vogel said, silencing the little man's protest with a deprecating wave. But we've got to know if you're ready. Let's talk about your job. Ameth relaxed. They talked shop for a few moments. Then Vogel opened a folder, took out his watch. Very good, he said. Now let's check your initiative potential. As Ameth stiffened, Vogel reassured him, Relax. It's a routine association test. For the next ten minutes, he timed Ameth's responses with a stopwatch. Most of the words were familiar shop words, and most of the responses were standard. Job. Escape, Ameth said instantly. Blueprint. Create. Noise. Hate. Want. Home. It was all so childish so obvious, and Ameth's eyes were frightened amber pools when Vogel dismissed him. No matter. Let him suspect. Vogel studied the reaction results with grim amusement. Outside, the shop roared, and Ameth's travelers sped the rounds. Issue material. Sheer to size. Form on break. Weld for print. Miter. Drill. Inspect. Stock. 
One by one the strange details were being formed, finished, to lie inert in the stockroom, to await final assembly. Assembly. Of what? Tonight was project completion. Midnight. Vogel stood in the darkness, leaning against the wall. He was tired. He had maintained this visual for three hours. His right leg was numb, and he started to shift positions, then froze as he heard footsteps. Three aisles over, a light exploded, blindingly. He held his breath. From inside, in fabrication, came the muffled clang of drill presses and power brake, and the sounds of the night shift. He waited. Three aisles over, something moved. Someone fumbled in the stock bins, collecting shaped pieces of metal, grunting with the effort of piling them on a salvage bench, now panting with impatience while assembling the parts. There was a hammering, a fitting together, a flash of light, a hum of power, and finally a sob of relief. Vogel's hand slipped into his pocket and grasped the gun. He moved silently. Ameth stood at the salvage bench, adjusting studs and connecting terminals. Vogel stared at the final assembly. It was a helmet, a large, silvery helmet, connected with a nightmarish maze of wiring mounted on a rectangular plastic base. It hummed, although there was no visible source of power. Ameth put on the helmet with a feverish haste. Vogel chuckled. Ameth stood motionless. Then, when his hand darted toward the stand, Vogel said sharply, Don't. Ameth stared at the gun. Take it off. Vogel's voice was iron. Ameth slowly took off the helmet. His eyes were golden with tears. Please, he said. Mars or Venus, Vogel said. Which? N neither. You could not grasp the concept. Let me go, please. Where, Vogel prodded. Another dimension? You would call it that, the alien whispered. Hope brightened in his face. You want something? Wealth? Power? It was the way he said the words, like the white trader offering his aborigine captors glass beads to set him free. Vogel nodded toward the circuit. That hookup. You trap the gravitational field directly? Cosmic rays? Your planet's magnetic force lines. Look, I'll leave you the schematic diagram. It's simple, really. You can use it to transmute. He babbled on with a heartbreaking eagerness and Vogel listened. In my own world, said Ameth brokenly, I am a moron, a criminal moron. Once, out of a childish malice, I destroyed beauty, one of the singing crystals. He shuddered. I was punished. They sent me here, to the snake pit. Sentence for felony. This, he indicated the helmet, would have fused three seconds after I used it. So, incidentally, would this entire shop. I had no time to construct a feedback dispersion. Tell me about your world, Vogel said. Ameth told him. Vogel's breath hissed softly between his teeth. All his life, a uniform vision had tormented him, driven him toward perfection. Apparently the vision was reality. He smiled, moved forward. You should have told me. Ameth saw the intent in his eyes and started to beg. Vogel clipped him behind the ear. He put the helmet on gingerly. The electrodes tingled against his temple, and his grin was wry as he thought of Alice. Then he depressed the stud. Vogel sobbed. Color blinded him. Rainbows blared in sweet, sparkling thunder. He whimpered, covered his eyes. The music drowned him in a fugue of weeping delight. Slowly, he raised his head. He stood ankle-deep in gold crystals that stretched out forever in a splendid sea of flame. The crystals sang softly, achingly, to the silver sun in the emerald sky. A grove of blue-needled trees tingled in ecstasy on his left. And beyond those trees, a city sang. 
white spires formed skyward in impossible cataracts of glory a glissando of joy burned his eardrums and he could not face that living splendor it was a city beyond dreams beyond legend a city where all dreams end he strode toward it raptly the crystal screamed the blue needle forest lashed wildly and terror shivered through the air in a shrieking dissonance from the blue forest people ran beautiful people with great golden eyes and scarlet tunics they had been emmet's brothers and sisters they stared horror and revulsion twisting their faces they started toward him vogel understood if destroying beauty on this world was a crime then killing ugliness must be a duty on this world he was ugly end of felony by james o causey